Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today's topic are primes. Well, or to be completely precise, unique factorization domains, um, U of D for short. And the main idea is that U of Ds kind of have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So let us start by recalling what the fundamental theorem of arithmetic actually is. So what you see right now is what I would call a factor tree. So you start with some number, 48, for example, and in each step of your factor tree, you try to build a tree out of it, you split uh, whatever kind of number you already have into further smaller numbers. So 48 is eight times six, for example. And well, you keep on going. Eight is four times two, six is two times three, four is two times two, and you keep on going until you hit, well, a prime number. And what makes those numbers prime is that you just can't split them any further anymore because, well, the only thing I can imagine for two would be one, two, and that's kind of boring. So you don't want that because why? Well, one is an invertible element and in ring theory, we don't care about invertible elements. So you kind of stuck um, or you kind of stop here. Uh, same for three and for the other twos. And yeah, so that's what's called a factor tree. And the point is, well, fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells you factor trees exist, which well, part one tells you factor trees exist, which just is saying that you can factor a number into its prime factor. And the main idea that I would like to discuss today is, yes, we want a generalization of this, right? So let me um, show you another factor tree of the same number. So it's again 48, but now I decided to split it differently. It's 24 times two, of course. So with two, I'm already stuck, so it's good. So it's a prime. And now I can split 24 further, six times four uh, and so on. And I get there two times three times two times two times two. So, so uh, let me go back here. I got two times two times two times two times three. So two to the four times three. That's what I got here. And here I also got two to the four times three, but in a kind of different order, two times three times two cubed. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells us, well, that factorization trees are not unique. They can't be, I just, I just showed you two different trees of the same example, but kind of their leaves are unique, right? So you will always see the same number of primes um, when you factor a prime. And it's this uniqueness statement of um, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So the fundamental theorem of arithmetic has two statements. It's an existence statement and it's a uniqueness statement. And we really want to have both for general rings. Why not? Why, oh, that's, Prime numbers are very important. We all learned that very early. So it makes sense to ask for factorization trees for prime numbers in general rings or as general as possible usually, right? Say it again, uniqueness, uh, this is this one, and existence, this is this one, uh, two, two, two statements. And well, just a slight disclaimer, uniqueness is of course a little bit uh, of, a, well, it, it's not really unique in that sense. So for example, I. I you can always add units somewhere. Um, so invertible elements. Again, I said again, in ring theory, we don't care for invertible elements. Kind of everything is only well defined up to invertible elements anyway. Anyway, um, so in this case, uniqueness is just meant that I see the same num I say the same leaves turning up at any stage, right? And I don't want to do something like that. I said again, I don't want to say as a minus one because minus one is invertible and the minus two. So again, I don't want to do that. Minus one is invertible, I don't care. So I just stop where I am. And then kind of the question is, well, let's generalize it to arbitrary rings. So what can we do? What are actually the two properties which gi give us those two uh, or those, those factor trees, those two statements that they exist and that they're unique? It turns out it's not the same. And that's maybe the only confusing point is that uh, the definition of a prime number or a prime element in uh, for a general ring will be slightly different from what you are usually used to. So this is, I, I think, what you see most of the time, the top one, and the bottom one is kind of the definition then of prime in a, in a general ring. So let's have a look. 
So um, the distinction here is that I would like to call it element irreducible, or as I said, prime. And irreducible is exactly like um, you get stuck somewhere and if you want to decompose it further than A o in A or B, so P, then actually, let's say A is invertible. A is a unit, right? So, or B, it doesn't matter. It's, let's say we're in a commutative case and it really doesn't matter at all. Um, and that's what's called irreducible. And if you think about this property a little bit, then um, the existence statement for irreducible elements using this property of prime numbers that, that you can't decompose them any further is, is kind of clear. It's not completely clear, but it's kind of clear because the only thing you, you just start with your number, you split it. And you keep on splitting, you keep on splitting until you hit a prime number until you hit an irreducible factor. And the only thing you need to make sure in order to get existence is that this process actually really does stop at one point. A priori, it could go on forever and then you're a little bit in trouble. But of course, for the, for the integers, it doesn't go on forever because in each step you get smaller and smaller and smaller until you hit something close to zero where you just stay. Um, but um, for, in this definition of irreducible, showing that such a tree exists is not usually not very hard. As I said, kind of the only thing you need to make sure is that there is no infinite chain of things and that you just, it should stop at one point, right? On the other hand, um, if you only know this property of, well, you keep on going until you hit something that you can't decompose any further, the uniqueness is, is really, really tricky to prove. Um, we will see an example later um, why, this, why this is supposed to be, well, why this is happening. Uh, the better definition to, for uniqueness, and then uniqueness actually almost immediately follows, is the following definition of a prime number, which is true for the integers, so just check it in your head. So if P divides A times B, then P divides A or B, right? So it's not very hard to show that actually in the integers, these, the, those definitions are equivalent. And kind of this looks more a little bit more innocent, that's why you usually see it. Um, but actually this one is the right one for ring theory. Um, in particular, the, the second one will imply that prime elements are really rare. There are not many prime elements. Irreducible, yeah, okay, you split everything further and the only thing you need to make sure basically, as I said, is that you at one point uh, stabilize basically, right? You don't have any, any infinite chains going on. Prime, that seems to be a little bit more of a delicate property. And yes, it is. Actually, it's a very delicate property. Anyway, so what I just said is, well, with the first definition, existence is easy to prove. I already explained that, like you just keep on going and right? you just keep on going until you can't go any further anymore. And uniqueness is easy for the other statement because it basically says no matter how I split my tree into A and B, I can be sure that my, my favorite prime will turn up at one of those, um, those splittings, right? That's kind of what this property says. And if you believe that, then you're already, well, already almost at the definition of the unique factorization domain. Right, it, it is, well, the equivalent definitions, let's use this one. It's saying that any non-zero element can be written as a, a product of prime numbers. So there are some primes, P, PK, there are some exponents, EK, and I don't care whether they are uh, just, so there's a unit also, right? So there's always an invertible element, I don't care, doesn't matter. Um, of course, you would put that in the formal definition, but yeah, invertible elements, as I said, in ring theory, we don't care about invertible elements. So what it's saying is it's a unique factorization domain when you can write any non-zero element as a um, product of primes. That really is just the statement that factor trees exist. And yeah, and it's then not really hard to, sh to show that if I demand that my elements are primes in this definition, then actually uniqueness follows pretty, pretty easy. So it has unique leaves, it's unique, which is kind of saying that this N uh, is, is always the same. So any factorization has the same length in, in this formulation. And up to reordering of, of the terms, the E's are also the same. 
What you could do alternatively is you can demand that factor trees for irreducible elements exist and unique. It's a little bit less um, satisfying because you need to demand two things. So existence doesn't completely come for free. As I said, there is always this risk of running into an infinite chain. Anyway, you could alternatively demand that they exist. And for irreducible, what is really the main need is that, that they are unique. Um, and yeah, like for the integers, actually you, for those uh, U of Ds, you don't care for the, about the difference between irreducible and prime. And the standard examples are, well, since we don't care for inverses in this part of ring theory, as I said, uh, oh, for invertible elements in this part of ring theory, as I said, uh, well, fields, of course. But um, mainly the main example are those two, so polynomial rings and the integers, of course. Um, but there are more fancy examples, like the Gaussians, uh, very nice link to the Gaussians, um, Gaussian primes is in the, in the description below. So what are prime numbers and Gaussian integers? And also a mathematical demonstration where you can try it out. It's actually a lot of fun. And then some more obscure examples like those ones here. Um, why you see exactly those D or those N is, is, is a bit, uh, well, it's one of those low number coincidences. Those D actually have a name there called Hegna numbers. Uh, link is in the description. They kind of play a, a very strange role in this part of ring theory or number theory. Okay, um, let me illustrate why we really need to be so careful with the distinction between irreducible and prime. So the standard example is this funny ring here. So z adjoint square root of minus five. This just means all elements are also form a b times square root of minus five. Um, where a and b are integers, okay? A and b are integers, very good. And it's pretty easy, it's not hard, but it's not, it's not obvious, but it's also not hard to check that two is irreducible, three is irreducible, this guy is irreducible, and this guy is irreducible. One plus square root of minus five, and one minus square root of minus five. But they are not primes, because unique factorization actually fails. So six is, of course, two times three, I, I think that sounds believable, but six is also uh, one plus square root of five times one minus square root of five. Uh, square root of minus five. I should always say square root of minus five. Um, so square root of minus five. As you can easily check by just factoring them. So unique factorization fails and none of them can be prime because uh, this guy divides six, but it doesn't divide neither three nor two. So um, unique factorization in this case actually does fail. Okay, so we have to be a bit careful what we call what, but in the end, well, a unique factorization domain is just something very much like the integers where you care about prime numbers and factor trees. Uh, yeah, so that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you next time.